Makers, Women Who Make America, Women in Business by Christina, Jennifer, and Lianco. In our presentation, our Women of Focus will be Lynn Elzenhans, Irene Rosenfeld, Mary Wells Lawrence, Elizabeth Arden, Oprah Winfrey, and Josephine Menser. Irene Rosenfeld received her education from the renowned Cornell University. She holds three degrees, a bachelor's in psychology, a master's degree in business, as well as a PhD in marketing and statistics. Rosenfeld's experience in the food and beverage industry has spanned across many companies. Her first job was at Danza Fitzgerald's Sample Advertising Agency in New York City, where she later joined General Foods in consumer research. In 2004, Rosenfeld was appointed chairperson and CEO of Frito-Lay, where she focused on product promotion. Rosenfeld was appointed CEO of Kraft Foods in 2006. However, on December 5th, Kraft announced that Rosenfeld would stay on as a chairperson of the $31 billion global snack company, which would be called Mondelez International Inc. Irene's influence in the business industry is profound. She has rearranged America's largest food company and successfully steered the $42 billion revenues for the company through the downturn. She led Mondelez towards a big push into e-commerce, and in her 11 years as the CEO, the first of Kraft Foods and now of Mondelez, she has made about $231 million. Another woman of focus is Ms. Lynn Elzenhans. She received her education from Rice University with a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics, as well as a master's degree in business administration from the renowned Harvard Business School. Lynn Elton Hahn's experience in the fuel industry has spanned quite a bit. She was the executive chairman of Sunico Inc. from January 2009 until May 2012 and the CEO and President from August 2008 until March 2012. She also served as Chairman of Sonico Logistic Partners from October 2008 until May 2012, and the CEO from July 2010 until March 2012. Elsa Hans worked at Royal Dutch Shell for more than 28 years, where she held a number of senior roles, including Executive Vice President, Global Manufacturing from 2005 to 2008. She served on Baker Hughes Incorporated Board of Directors from 2012 to July 2007 and as the Director of FlowServe Cooperation within the last five years. Among the fuel industry, Lynn Elton Hans is a household name. She is the first woman to run a major oil company while pushing the company into biofuels and acquiring a new plant in upstate New York. Since she took the helm in 2008, Sunigo has added 250 retail gas stations. The company also spun off its profitable coke-making business, which supplies raw materials to international steelmakers. In little more than three years in the driver's seat, Elzenaz has directed the sale of its chemical business and all but removed the company from refining. Next, we are going to talk about Mary Wells Lawrence. These are some photos from her at her time working in Jack Tinker and Partners in the 1960s. So Mary Wells Lawrence moved to New York with her father because she wanted to pursue a career in acting, but instead she attended the Carnegie Institute of Technology in Pittsburgh at the age of 18. Uh, she then went on to marry uh, a fellow student, Bert Wells, in 1949, and they had moved away uh, to where Bert Wells, her husband's job, was located. But they actually moved back to New York City in 1952, and Mary got a job as a fashion advertising manager at Macy's. Um, she had worked at several department stores before that. Um, after Macy's, she moved on and worked at McCann. Erickson as writer and copy group head. 
There, she managed several retail-oriented accounts like Talon Inc. So, Mary Wells Lawrence then went on to work at Lennon and Newell. Uh, but that company eventually dismantled itself and the employees left and they actually paid the employees a generous amount uh, to leave. She went to Europe with that money and when she came back in 1957, she had a huge desire to work in the advertising industry. So in 1957, she got a job at Doyle Dan Burnback. Burn there she worked as a copywriter and she eventually became vice president's associate copy chief. She was known greatly for her work in General Mills and Max Factor & Co. As you can see from the information provided before, Mary Wells Lawrence um, worked at several advertising companies. And she did this to work herself up the corporate louder. In 1964, Mary Wells Lawrence went on to work at Jack Tinker & Partners. Uh, there she was paid $60,000 a year and was given more creative freedom. At that time, 60000 a year was a lot because 60000 a year is a lot today in 2017. Um, I believe that in Jack Tinker and Partners is where she really developed in terms of her creativity and advertising. She worked on campaigns like Alka-Seltzer, no matter what shape your stomach's in, and that actually won a Clio Award in 1964. She also worked on the famous Braniff International Campaign, The End of This Plain Plain, and she worked on both of those campaigns with her creative partners, Dick Rich and Stuart Green. And the Brain of International campaign was very successful because it didn't, the, you know, with the plane, the plane didn't necessarily go faster than other planes and so on. It just, the campaign made the airplane more attractive and that attracted a lot of consumers. So in terms of the Brain of International campaign, she rebranded the airline company by changing the decorations. And by that, I'm talking about, you know, the outfits of the air, airplane attendants and so on. It was also one of her, one of the first of her biggest projects, which became a big hit. And when this became a big hit, she became a big hit on Madison Avenue in the advertising world. Below, you could see a picture of one of her advertisements. It says, ever since I made the centerfold of Playboy, I fly on Brain If. When you got it, flaunt it. So, in a sense, Mary Wells Lawrence made flying sexy, and people loved it. Just some advertisements from the Alka-Seltzer. Tis the season to plop flop, fizz fizz, fast fast. And chomp chomp, sip sip, flop flop, <laughs> fizz fizz. Alka-Seltzer, what a relief it is. And Mary Wells Lawrence worked a lot with Alka-Seltzer campaigns. So the Rainiff International Project was very important for Mary Wells Lawrence because if she did well, which she did because the campaign was very successful, they would possibly promote her to president of Jack Tinker and Partners, but they did not because Jack Tinker told her that, you know, men were not ready to accept a woman as president of an advertising agency, but that, you know, she'd still be paid as a president she'd still have the authority as a president but that wasn't good enough for mary wells lawrence so she quit mary wells would say that desire beats talent all the time and that's what she held on to when she left and she set up a shop in the gotham motel in 1966 her new agency was called wells rich green um wells rich green because her 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 creative partners from her last um company jack tinkers Rich and Green left with her. Um, Madison Avenue was actually not sure that a female president could do much, that a female president could deliver. But soon we'll find out that that was not the case. She started the company with the creative partners she had worked with at her last job. And in all, 11 people from Tinker moved to work in Mary Wells' new company. So contrary to what Madison Avenue believed, everybody actually wanted to work, uh, wanted Mary Wells to be their agency. And Mary would do a lot of research on her projects uh, to deliver the best product. In the 1950s and the 1960s, in almost every industry, 
Women were denied access to power, but Mary Wells Lawrence created her own stepping stone to power by starting her own company. Um, companies, huge companies like Brainiff International, who, were, who was once working with Jack Tinkers and Partners at her old company, actually moved on to work with Mary Wells' new company, um, Wells Rich and Green. And here to the right, you'll see a photo of Mary Wells Lawrence and her two creative partners, Rich and Green, back in nineteen in the 1960s. Just a little touch on Mary Wells Lawrence's personal life. She actually married Brainiff's president and future chairman, Harding Lawrence, in 1967. Uh, that's when she became known Mary Wells Lawrence, and I believe they divorced sometime in 2002. Here below you'll see a picture of Mary Wells and Mr. Harding Lawrence, side by side in the 60s. So Wells, Rich, and Green, WRG, actually became very successful. They were billing about $30 million at the end of 1967 with clients such as Philip Morris and Benson and Hedges 100 Cigarettes. And that's not bad at all for having had started in April of 1966. To the right here, you can see one of WRG's campaigning slogans for Benson and Hedges 100 cigarettes. In 1968, Wells Rich and Green went public, and Mary Wells Lawrence was the first female chief executive officer in a company traded on the New York Stock Exchange. They returned to private in 1977. Here is a picture of Mary Wells Lawrence working in her company, Wells, Rich, and Green, with her creative partners. Here's just a picture of Mary Wells Lawrence working at her desk in her company, Wells, Rich, and Green, in 1967. I just really like this photo because it, it really shows the independence of Mary's Mary Well Lawrence and the outcome of her desire to become successful in the advertising industry. Here are some more notable achievements by Mary Wells Lawrence. At age 40, she became the youngest person to be inducted into the Copywriters Hall of Fame. She was the most powerful woman in the advertising industry. She was making about $300,000 by 1976, becoming one of the highest paid women executives. In 1976, Wells, Rich, and Green had billings of $187 million, which made it the 15th largest ad agency in the United States. All very impressive uh, for a woman having to overcome a lot of obstacles, especially in the corporate world back in the 1960s and the 1970s. Wells, Rich and Green created a lot of famous advertising slogans that are famous to this day, such as I Love New York, which you literally see all over New York, and that was created to encourage New York tourism. Also, Quality is Job One for Ford Motor Co. And Try It, You'll Like It for Alka-Seltzer. And to the right, you will see a picture of Mary Wells Lawrence sometime recently holding up a sign of her slogan, I Love New York. These were some campaigns, as previously noted, that they worked on. Quality's Job One for Ford and Alka-Seltzer, Try It, You'll Like It. The uh, Wells, Rich and Green did these in the 1970s. So Mary Wells Lawrence retired in 1990 at the age of 62 and sold Wells, Rich and Green to BDDP International, which is a company in Paris, France. And in 1997, Wells, Rich and Green stopped all operations. In 1971, she was named Advertising Woman of the Year, and in 1999, Mary Wells Lawrence was inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame by the American Advertising Federation. They had said that she was the force behind one of the most creative shops in the history of advertising. So these are some quotes from Mary Wells Lawrence that I really like. Um, one of them is, The best advertising should make you nervous about what you're not buying I believe this quote shows her expertise in the field of advertising. Another one is, it's an ideal business for women. It's made for women. 
It needs women intuition. It needs women's thinking. Another quote, which is my favorite, by Mary Wells Lawrence says, You can't just be you. You have to double yourself. You have to read books on subjects you know nothing about. You have to travel to places you never thought of traveling. You have to meet every kind of person and endlessly stretch what you know. If you click on this link, you will be able to access the famous Alka-Seltzer commercial with the famous slogan created by WRG, Try it, you'll like it. I watched it and I think it was a great commercial because it shows the application of the product. Next, I will be talking about Elizabeth Arden, an entrepreneur and business leader. She was born in 1881 and passed in 1966. Her name was actually Florence Graham, but it was changed when she, it was changed when she joined forces with Elizabeth Hubbard in 1909 to start a cosmetics line. Um, so she took Elizabeth's first name and she took Arden from a poem that she really liked. Elizabeth Arden actually changed makeup in the way in that it was seen by society. She made she made cosmetics and makeup respectable. So Elizabeth Arden uh, grew up in a poor family, and so she had to work as a child to help her family make ends meet. And she actually ended up studying nursing. But in 1907, she moved to New York City, and she loved the modern life because she had actually grew up in a farm. In New York City, she got a job as an assistant to a beautician named Eleanor Edier. There she learned everything she could about the beauty industry, how things were advertised, how to perform facials, how to sell to customers, and drawing clients, etc. She became so good at her job that clients would request her for facial treatments. After having had gained experience at her last job, she decided to open her own salon with a partner, Elizabeth Herbert, in 1910. And it was located on Fifth Avenue, but their partnership dismantled in 1914, but Elizabeth decided to stay in the industry. So she ran a business at a time when few women ran major companies. And below you'll see a picture of one of her displays in New York City. So Elizabeth worked to grow her business as she hired chemists to help her create one of the first products in her line, uh, face cream and lotion. Uh, but she would give manicures after hours to help pay for her rent on Fifth Avenue. Below is a photo of... Um, one of her salons on Fifth Avenue. So by 1915, she was selling her products internationally and her company was close to becoming a global brand. In 1922, she was opening salons in places like Australia and South America. Even during the Great Depression, where about 25% of the uh, population in the United States was unemployed, her company thrived and flourished as it brought in more than $4 million a year. Elizabeth Arden was very active in the Women's Right March at the time as she participated in the Women's Right March in 1912. The woman in the march actually wore red lipstick as a sign of solidarity, which was supplied by Elizabeth Arden herself. As you can see in the photo to the right, the women in the march are wearing red lipstick. Elizabeth Arden would later on in her career develop a line of cosmetics for women specifically in the military. The ad to the right is stating that men are more aware of women when they wear Elizabeth Arden's lipstick. As you can see in the ad, the man is staring at the woman in the ad. The ad also states how well it goes with the uniform and how long-lasting the lipstick is. It finishes off by stating that every woman should own an Elizabeth Arden lipstick. Elizabeth Arden also paved the way for many items we use nowadays such as travel-sized items, and was the first to offer in-store makeovers and operated high-end spas. To the right, you could see a picture of one of Elizabeth Arden's high-end spas. Elizabeth Arden also became interested in owning horse races and in 1945 founded the Main Chance Farm. In 1947, she was featured in Time magazine about her success in a male-dominated field like horse racing, as in 1947, one of Arden's horses won the Kentucky Derby. Below you could see pictures of Elizabeth Arden with a few of her horses from her farm. 
Arden was awarded the Légion de Honneur from the French government in 1962 for her contributions to the cosmetic industry. By the time of her death in 1966, Elizabeth Arden had opened more than 100 salons worldwide and had a line with almost 300 cosmetic products. These are some quotes from Elizabeth Arden and I feel that quotes give you an insight as to who the person really was or is. So to start, to be beautiful is the birthright of every woman. Another one is, it's remarkable what a woman can accomplish with just a little ambition. Lastly, my favorite, dear, never forget one little point. It's my business, you just work here. This one was said to her husband, which was something unconventionally done at the time. Next, Jennifer will talk about Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey is not only a celebrity, she is a leader and hero known all around the world. Due to her strong work ethic and dedication, Winfrey was able to build herself up to the inspiring woman she is today. Winfrey's generous and positive mindset gave people support and hope that they can accomplish so much despite their past. I chose Oprah Winfrey because she is an incredible inspiration for many young women and has showed people how a rough start can lead to a greater ending. Oprah Winfrey was born to Renita Lee and Vernon Winfrey in Mississippi on January 29, 1954. Unfortunately, Winfrey's parents separated after she was born and left her in the care of her maternal grandmother in Mississippi. Due to Winfrey's strict grandmother, Winfrey learned how to read at only two years old. Also, Winfrey skipped kindergarten after writing a note to her teacher on the first day of school saying that she belonged in the first grade. At six years old, Winfrey was sent to join her mother at an extremely poor and dangerous neighborhood. At 12 years old, she was sent to live with her father at Nashville, Tennessee, where she began making speeches at churches and one time even earned $500 for a speech. Then Winfrey again joined her mother, and the horrible neighborhood had a negative effect on Winfrey's teenage years. Her problems worsened by sexual abuse starting at the age of nine by men that her family trusted. When Oprah was in high school, she won a speech contest and earned a full scholarship to college. She used the scholarship to attend Tennessee State University. In 1971, Oprah was encouraged to enter the Miss Teen Fire Prevention Pageant. Much to her surprise, she won first place. In the interview, Oprah said that her goal was to become a broadcast journalist. After the pageant, she was offered a job as a newsreader on the local radio. She loved that job and knew that her future was going to be in radio and TV. While still attending college, Oprah got a call from the CBS news station in Nashville. They wanted her to be their news anchor. She couldn't believe it. She took the job and became the first female African-American news anchor in Nashville history. She was only 19 at the time. In 1976, Oprah moved to a TV station in Baltimore, Maryland. At first, she worked as a news anchor, but things weren't working out very well. She was moved to a TV talk show called People Are Talking. She was then recruited to host a morning TV show in Chicago called AAM Chicago. A few years later, in 1986, the show was renamed The Oprah Winfrey Show and was shown all over the country. With the launch of The Oprah Winfrey Show, Oprah became one of the most famous people in the country. Over 10 million people watch her show every day. Oprah also made a lot of money. Her show made $125 million the first year. Beauty Beautician and business executive Estee Lauder, born in Queens, New York in 1908, started a beauty company with a skin cream developed by her chemist uncle. After years of selling products on her own, she officially formed Estee Lauder Cosmetics Inc. in 1946. Lauder was as innovative with her marketing strategies as her cosmetic products, eventually making her the richest self-made woman in the world. Her business, which includes such products, lines as Estee Lauder, MAC Cosmetics, and Clinique, continues to thrive to this day. In the late 1920s, Estee met Joseph Lauder. They were married in 1930 and moved to Manhattan. Estee started selling skincare and makeup in beauty salons, demonstrating her products on women while they were sitting under hair dryers. In 1946, she and Joseph Lauder officially started the company, and a year later they got their first major order, $800 worth of products from Saks Fifth Avenue. 
As a visionary businesswoman, Estee Lauder was honored with many awards during her career. She has supported numerous civic and cultural programs and other charitable causes. The only thing more important to Estee than the company was her family, and she was thrilled that her children and grandchildren joined the family business. Estee retired in 1995 and passed away in 2004. So these are the references that we used throughout our research project. I hope that you guys enjoyed the video and learned a lot from it. Thanks for watching.